Hello everyone, welcome to the module on intermolecular forces and potential energy surfaces. We are currently discussing about potential energy surfaces and the potential energy surfaces of different kinds of molecules, either triatomic or even other kinds of systems. Before we get into looking at potential energy surfaces in a little more detail in this lecture, let us just recap our memories on what we discussed in the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we had started out by looking at uh, what are called as potential energy surfaces and we had said that these are nothing but a three dimensional or a n dimensional hypersurface in which by playing around with the coordinates or different modes or different uh, degrees of freedom of a given molecule or atoms or ions, one can actually look at the potential energy of the system. And such a diagram of potential energy versus the coordinates is what one would call a potential energy surface. And in case of where we are looking at chemical reactions, these coordinates are typically the vibrational degrees of freedom such as the bond lengths, bond angles and various other degrees of freedom. So, we had seen that uh, based on the kinds of the molecule, one could have either a hypersurface of 3n minus 5 or 3n minus 6, where n is the number of atoms or ions in the given system. Further, we had also said that these three dimensional surfaces can also be mapped onto two dimensional uh, picture, which is called as a reaction coordinate diagram. And here, uh, what one does is to look at along a particular coordinate of interest that is either a particular bond length or a bond angle or even a combination of them and then draw them on a two dimensional representation. This is typically what one would use in uh, looking at the transition states of a given reaction or even the transition state theory uh, of a particular species. So, having said this, we had also uh, learnt or discussed what is called as a saddle point, which is a very important uh, aspect when we talk about potential energy surfaces and reaction coordinate diagrams. So, if we take a, a diagram such as uh, shown here, the one which we had looked at in the previous class as well, what we said is that this point where going from the one valley to the other, the hill one crosses is what is called as a, a saddle point. And we had seen that it is called a saddle because of the way it looks like that is on the two sides the energy is actually going down and on the orthogonal sides the energy actually increases. So, an important point to note is that uh, a saddle point is invariably a highest energy point on a two dimensional reaction coordinate diagram. However, when it comes to a potential energy surface of 3 or n dimensions, it is not the highest energy point. It is always somewhere in between because there are points of highest energy such as uh, you could see here on the, the green parts of the surface are the ones which are actually having a higher energy compared to the saddle point. So, a key distinction is on the two dimensional picture that is the reaction coordinate diagram, saddle point represents the point of highest energy whereas on a n dimensional or a, or a n dimensional hypersurface which is called as a potential energy surface, saddle point does not represent the point of highest energy. This is a very important distinction to keep in mind. So, having sort of refreshed our memories on what, what are called as reaction coordinate diagrams and potential energy surfaces, now let us start looking at a very simple case of a H3 system. So, for that I am going to try and uh, write down the uh, reaction which we are interested in first. So, let us say I have a, an hydrogen atom H A which is interacting with an hydrogen molecule. Just to read, uh, distinguish the hydrogens, I am writing them as H A B and C and this would give me H A H B plus H C. Okay. So, if I am 
interested in this particular kind of a system where a hydrogen atom is reacting with the hydrogen molecule to give rise to a similar product but with a slightly different connectivity. In this particular scenario what can happen is the two entities that is the HA and HBHC can actually approach in two different ways. One is they can approach in a collinear fashion that is HA is approaching the HBC bond or it can also approach in a non-collinear fashion that is at a different angle or at a particular angle. For the sake of the convenience and what why and it also turns out that that is the most reasonable way we shall look at only the collinear case that is the HA and HBHC are actually interacting in a more of a head on fashion. So, if we now uh, restrict ourselves to the collinear uh, uh, way of interaction then in order to represent this we can actually choose two coordinates or two uh, degrees of freedom. One is the bonding between the HA HB that is we are going to form a new bond between HA and HB. So, we can look at the uh, how does the potential energy uh, varies as a function of this that is R A B and we can also look at how does the potential energy varies as this bond actually gets ruptured that is R B and C. So, these are the two parameters which we can vary and look at how does the total energy or the potential energy of the system varies. So, if you now agree that these two parameters are uh, good enough to describe the particular system we are interested in that is H3 in this particular case, then one can come up with a, a potential energy surface which is uh, shown on the left hand side. And invariably such potential energy surfaces are constructed by what are called as electronic structure calculations which are typically based on quantum mechanical uh, quantum mechanics based computations where both these parameters that is the the distance between the HA HB and the distance between the HB HC are varied and at each of the coordinates that is each of these points the total energy of the system is or the potential energy of the system is calculated and that is plotted as a function of these two coordinates. And if one does it we would uh, for the system for the H3 system we would end up in a diagram which would look like this. Uh, so, we will try and dissect this a bit more and try to understand this. So, let us start by looking at uh, this diagram in a bit more detail. Okay, here I am trying to look at HB plus HC. So, I have HB HC which is bonded and I do not yet have HA which is still uh, interacting with it. So, if I just take the uh, reactant that is HB and HC then I would see that uh, the one which is uh, one we can see on the left hand side is the uh, one you can look at it as a one dimensional potential energy surface of uh, HB HC correct. That is you have an equilibrium uh, bond distance where the HB and HC are bonded and now in this particular case the HA is somewhere here this is at an infinite distance. And only once the HA starts approaching the uh, HB HC the energy of the system varies and then they interact and ultimately lead to the product where HA and HB are bonded and HC is left out free. And that is what one would find if you look at this particular uh, part of the uh, potential energy surface. Here you have HA HB which are bonded and HC is now free. So, I hope uh, you, okay, you see or you can imagine this where I am going from a one uh, two dimensional kind of a potential uh, energy surface of a one hydrogen uh, molecule to another that is the product and what is interesting is how or what path does it take. That is something which is uh, very important and we shall look at it in a bit more detail. But to look at it in a more of a, a bird's eye view what we have is we have uh, two degrees of freedom in the H3 system that is the two uh, bond lengths which can be varied that is RAB and RBC. And if we take these two as the variables one can construct a three dimensional potential energy surface where, where two axes are these two uh, uh, coordinates and the third axis is the potential energy. 
and that would look like what is shown here in the on the slide. I hope this is uh, clear or at least understandable and if that is the case now let us go ahead and look at how does one actually take this and map it onto a two dimensional uh, picture so that it is easier to understand these uh, potential energy surfaces to, for further analysis. So again we start with to map this uh, potential energy surfaces from a three dimensional to two dimensional picture. Let us just start by looking at this uh, 3D picture which we have of a H3 system which is, which is what we just looked at in the previous slide. And, and just another way of looking at it is that you can now forget about the pink parts and only look at the grey area. If you just concentrate on the grey area, all I have done is I have just scooped out the uh, pink portions and I have just left with the grey area. And if you just now look at the grey area, what you would see is something like this. And the most important point to note in this is that here you have the reactant which is this particular uh, part and then you go to the product which is this uh, on this side that is the, uh, uh, the this coordinate. But what is important is while going from the reactant to the product you go through a slightly higher energy uh, position which is actually hidden if you look at this three dimensional picture. You do not see this higher energy point when you look at it uh, uh, when you look at a three dimensional picture. So that is the reason why we have scooped out the, uh, the, the pink portions and then hopefully this is a bit more clear that while going from the reactant to the product you have a slide uh, you have a barrier which you cross and then fall into the product regime. So now the question is how do I map this into two dimensional uh, picture. So to do this uh, what people typically do is uh, what are called as a slicing or a contour maps and that is what you see here on the right hand side. Uh, this is what is called as a 2D contour map of a H3 system and the way to obtain this is first what we need to realize is that uh, if you actually look at this picture, the three dimensional picture, here you have the, uh, you have the RBC and the RAB actually uh, both pointing uh, at one particular direction and whereas if you look at the now the 2D picture, they are actually not in the, uh, in the exactly same orientation. That is this two dimensional picture is the obtained or at least it is shown by just tilting it at a, at a particular angle. So please realize that this diagram is actually not in exactly the same way as this three dimensional potential energy surface but it is just slightly tilted so that the 2D map becomes a bit more clearer. So just to uh, make that clear that point. So if you now take this okay so if you now look at this picture what you see is that RAB and RBC are pointing towards the top right hand corner that is this whereas if you now look at the uh, the three dimensional potential energy surface you have these two pointing at the down so you will have to actually th take this uh, three dimensional object or three dimensional potential energy surface and rotate in such a way that this the bottom uh, corner actually turns to the top right corner. So then you would be able to translate or at least you will be able to imagine the how one can go from a, a three dimensional surface to a two dimensional contour maps. So this is point number one and the second point is uh, what typically people do is once i have done that uh, rotation that just in plane rotation then what what tip people typically do is you take a slice or in other words you choose a particular potential energy for example i will let's say choose this i'm just drawing a plane here so I have chosen a particular potential energy, let us say I call it P1. So then at this point I will look at the, at for both the coordinates how does the potential energy surface look like and I see that that would typically correspond to this, something like this. Because you have the, this, uh, this shape which is going here, this particular line or this particular curve is what one would get as this, when you cut a when you cut through it 
you would get this particular line, right? So that is what I'm trying to show here. And to some extent, you would also cut this. That is here somewhere you would cut if I pass a plane through it. And these are the two lines you would get for a given particular potential energy. Now I will come down a bit and I will again put again slice it or I will again go to a different potential energies. Let us say I call it PE2. So then I can actually keep doing like this. I can just keep slicing this or uh, taking a slice at different potential energy surfaces and look at how does the 2D map look like. So as you keep doing this till you come to this point or till you come to this point you, you only cut these two sides that is this side and on the other side is this right. Once you hit this particular point somewhere uh, as you keep going down the potential energy you will hit this point. At that point you are mostly at this, uh, this juncture okay. And now if you actually go down further then what you see is that you actually see a, a, this is this can be imagined like a small hill here. So if you have a small hill then if you are cutting through this then you would get a you would get these kind of uh, let us say curved lines this is what one would get as you go below the top of this hill this is the top this is the hill top. If you go below that then you would start getting curvatures like this and you can actually as you go close uh, as you go even down further down you would this would become actually uh, the uh, the radius of this or the, uh, the radius would become lower and you would end up at the minimum of the particular bond that is either the reactant or the product. So this is what typically is uh, done to obtain a two dimensional contour from a 3 or n dimensional uh, potential energy surface. So I will again repeat a few of the silent feature, salient features which are used to attain a 2 dimensional uh, contour that is first you take the 3 dimensional surface and you slice or you take a uh, uh, cut at different energies or different points and then look at how does the 2D plot look like and that is all that you are trying to plot here on the right hand side. And I hope this is you can visualize this to at least some extent that the way we are able to construct and the most important point is that if you uh, take a look at this the bottom left picture then you will realize that there is a small hill with a barrier which is actually hidden in this uh, three dimensional complete three dimensional uh, potential energy surface. And only below the barrier you start seeing the, uh, the corresponding contour maps which are uh, which correspond to either the reactant or the product. All right. So I hope this gives you a feel of uh, what are these 2D contour maps. So having had some feel for this, now let us go ahead and try to see the uh, H3 system in a little more detail. So here again, uh, what what is drawn is the same picture which I uh, showed you on the previous slide. That is the RBC and the RAB. And what I would uh, want you to realize or appreciate is the following. That if you now look at, uh, I am just going to draw a dotted line here. Okay. So this is the equilibrium uh, distance for AB which is the product. And similarly I can draw something along this line. And this is the R equilibrium bond length for the reactant that is B and C, right? And if I were to, uh, this is where the they would all the energies would go towards the infinity or towards the isolated atoms. So if I have this particular picture, so then if let's say I have an uh, hydrogen A which is coming towards uh, HB, so how should it come on the potential energy surface, right? So there are three possibilities. And we shall look at all of them in a little detail. So the possibility number 1 is or let us call it A because that is the notation we are using here. So I have HA and HBHC. 
So, this is coming approaching this. So, So, what I am trying to show is that the HA is approaching the HBHC progressively and at that moment the HBHC is kept constant or the equilibrium bond length of HBHC is kept constant, it does not move. And at beyond a certain point, now after this what happens is that HA and HB bond and then you have HC which is left out. Okay. So, this is one particular scenario where I have the HA which is approaching, the HA is approaching the HBC progressively and in all this time the HB and the HC bond length or the equilibrium bond length is kept constant, it does not change. This is one particular scenario you can think of. If that is the case, let us see how does the uh, potential energies or the trajectory would look like on a 2D contour. So, we said that RBC is the equilibrium distance for the uh, BC. So, that is what we have kept constant here. If you now look at the uh, trajectory which is marked with A, that is this particular line. If you start taking a look at this particular line, the R equilibrium is more or less constant. It does not change pretty much till you uh, till you hit this line, till you hit this curve. right? And, and all through all of this, what is changing is? the hydrogen atom which was at the uh, which was far away is actually slowly coming in slowly coming in and trying to go towards the HBHC bond that is what we have shown here on the right hand side. Once it is at almost this particular juncture let us uh, let us call this this dotted uh, point at this point what happens is then suddenly the uh, HBHC bond would break apart and then the HAHB would bond would form and you have a significant lowering of energy and that would lead to formation of the R equilibrium AB which is the product here which is what you would see. right? So, this is one particular trajectory the, uh, the reaction can take place. But if you already notice what you see is that this is along a slightly higher energy path because you are looking at it from a, uh, this path almost coincides with an outermost line which means the reaction is taking place along a higher energy surface. right? So, now the other option or the other uh, possibility is what is called as B. Let us take a look at the B. So, the HA is here and let us say HB HC is to begin with. Okay. So, in this particular case uh, what is happening is HA is approaching the HBHC, but in this case the HBHC bond is actually getting loosened up far more quickly. It is actually going from the equilibrium bond length, the HBHC is slowly opening up or it is uh, HBHC are dissociating much more rapidly than the approach of the HA. This is another scenario, right? So, you can think of uh, the, these two are the most classical ends of the spectrum, right? So, if this is what is happening, then you would go along this path which is uh, shown here B, that is at even a small uh, approach of HA which is along this direction, you see that there is a significant uh, lowering of the R equilibrium that is this angle, uh, this distance is actually now going uh, is increasing and by the time it comes to the equilibrium it has increased so much and then suddenly it will then it will uh, the HBHC will break and you will form a HAHB. Then one can write HAHB and HC is lost. right? So, this is another example where the dissociation is much more uh, pronounced compared to the approach of the incoming hydrogen atom. However, the another possibility is that both these processes that is the approach of the hydrogen atom and the weakening of the HBHC bond can occur to the same extent or to a similar extent. So, that is what we will call it as a KC. 
So, in this case the approach and the breaking these two processes are occurring at the same distance or, uh, or occurring at the uh, occurring to the same extent. So, in that case what would happen is you would take this particular path which is the C you go along the path C and then you ultimately end up in the product here right. So, this path where you get the uh, where you go through this particular uh, pathway is when you actually cross that small hill which I told you in the previous slide where we had scooped out the uh, pink part and only looked at the grey part. I, I hope you remember that there is a small hill and along the path C actually you cross the uh, you cross the top of that hill which is the C and it turns out that C point C is the or the C dagger which is shown here is the least energy uh, path among the A, B, C. So, the reaction would invariably would like to go along C rather than A and B because A and B are higher energy or this is the low energy path. The C. So, this point or the C dagger is what is also called as a saddle point or a transition state and the geometries in and around that are what are called as activated complexes. So, if a reaction is taking place along this particular trajectory or path then there is more likelihood of the reaction falling into the products rather than when it goes along A and B. Okay. So, I hope this has given you at least some uh, idea on uh, how to look at uh, the trajectories on a potential energy surfaces uh, taking H3 as an example. With this we shall stop now in the subsequent classes we shall look at a bit more of the finer details. Thank you.